Triumph of the Gospel, Part 8. We will be celebrating the triumphant entry of Jesus. Correct? Give him your palm. Come on, right? He's worthy. You may not feel like it. You may not want to, right? I want to actually, I'm going to ask how many of you honestly didn't feel like coming to church this morning? I have my hand up. Yeah, I have to come. Doesn't mean I have to like it. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. But I want you to understand that. One thing I want to just impart to you before I get into the message today is when we're worshiping here, and sometimes I'm just hearing what the Spirit is saying, and I'll probably elaborate on this sometime in the future, but this, the worship is both a battleground and a playground. Does that make sense to you? There's a place where you just revel in God's presence. There's been times I worship because I had to, because I had no other choice. And then there's times where you're going to battle. Aren't you glad that someone rides into battle with you? So I want to encourage you this morning as we, you know, continue and going forward when we're worshiping the Lord and we're doing that. Show him your palm, but not like this. Raise him up. Lift his presence high, right? Remember that song, Lord, I lift your name on high? The way you could do it, just lift him up. Anyway, that was my own two cents on that. Palm Sunday. Ding! Ding! You're probably wondering what that is. It's a sound effect. But more than that, it was an announcement. See, when I was a kid, and I was running around outside in the middle of the summer in the sweltering heat, doing absolutely nothing but playing. When I heard that second ding, I didn't wait for the third one. I knew exactly what it was, and I ran over to my grandparents, and in Spanish, I said, Papi, dame bendicito, que usted estaba para para un poquito de algo, por favor. Which means something I'm not going to tell you about. You got it a little bit, right? Mary and I know, ha ha. <laughs> and when I heard that sound on the street, my friends and all 78 of us didn't wait for the third D. We knew exactly what was being proclaimed and announced in the street. The good human man, Mr. Softy, Mr. Ice Cream, Mr. Cholesterol, Mr. Sugar, Mr. Whatever was coming down the street, and I had to go get it. There was no pause, there was no hesitation. None of you have ever seen me run, but I guarantee you, I did those 14 steps in two seconds flat to go up the stairs of my grandparents, grab that money, run back down without even tripping, kick the cat, and got to the ice cream truck. The sound of that ice cream truck announced to me wonderful confectionery joy. No joke, right? Wonderful memories. But here's the thing about that. I didn't go like this when I heard the dinger go, oh, yeah, that's the ice cream truck. Yeah. I mean, really, what kid does that? If they know what's good. And listen, I always, how many of you had that one friend that never had money? When you had to go get the ice cream, and then all of a sudden, like 10 minutes later, that money all, oh, I just found my money in my sneaker. Right? But as a child, I did not hesitate. When I heard the announcement through the sound of the bell of that ice cream truck, I knew what I had to do. This kid was on a mission, as all my friends were. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 21. We're talking about Palm Sunday. We're talking about Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 9, and I'll read through that from the NIV. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. 
And this is in Zechariah. It says, say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you. Pay attention to that. Your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, what? Hosanna, Lord, save us. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they said again, Hosanna in the highest. Today I want to share with you is make a way for the king. Make a way for the king. If you're studying anything about the Middle Ages or the medieval times or anything in, in the old age and antiquity, there was usually in the high court of the king a uh, royal herald. And what the herald would do was they would announce the presence of the king. If the king was coming in his procession, whether it was in the middle of the town square, the city square, whether there was a march or a proceeding, the, the, the herald's job was to announce the presence of the king. Um, how many, some of you may know who the newsboys are, and they have a wonderful song, which I didn't think about until later, but the lyrics are, make a way for, make a way for the king, the king is coming. And so the herald would make his proclamation a lot like when I told you about the ice cream truck, when as soon as I heard the sound, there was a response once I heard that, that proclamation of that sound. So the job, the, the job of the herald was to say, the king is coming. That was the job. Uh, 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 the king. As a, a matter of fact, I did a little digging around, and not only did the herald just announce the presence of the king, it was definitely during the time of war. I want you to understand that, because it doesn't make sense. How many of you understand that God does things sometimes that doesn't make sense to us? But see, he works in the supernatural. His ways are not our ways, and nor our thoughts are his thoughts. And so, He's planning something for you and I. He's planning for you individually. He's planning for your family. He's planning for your home and your household. He's planning for this church. I think God is going to do miraculous things. Get ready. Right? It's a miracle that I'm standing here today. There's lots of times I, I could have and should have given up if I tell you half of the stuff I've been through. And so here's this herald. They proclaim the king and they announce the king. But with the proclamation comes an expectation. I'll say that again. With the proclamation comes an expectation. I did a little further study, and I found out that there is correct protocol when you walk into the presence of royalty. I don't know how many of you have watched Mr. Bean. That's all I got to say, <laughs> right? As <laughs> you're meeting the queen, book, <laughs> you know? If you've seen it, I, I, it's probably on YouTube somewhere. There's a way to address a, a king or a queen or royalty, and there's a way not to do it, right? I'm doing a lot of substitute teaching in the schools, and there's a way you address a teacher in a way you shouldn't. There's also a way you should address a student in a way you shouldn't either. It goes both ways. And so when the herald says, make way for the king, there is actually an expectation. There's a protocol. See, what happens was I really believe that all the people that are saying, Hosanna, there are a bunch of them that really believe that he was the king. But I think a lot of them also kind of joined in with a little bit of the bandwagoners. You know what I mean by bandwagoners? You know, they're kind of like, oh, they're doing it too. <laughs> you know? right? It's like we used to do this in the city. So when I was younger, Especially to the tourists, we were mean. I'm going to admit it now, confession. So I lived in New York. So what happens is a lot of times you stop and go and just look up. And then before you know it, about two or three minutes later, there's about four or five people behind you going, yeah, I see it. And I'm looking at nothing. <laughs> you see it on social media. One person sat down and everybody saw it. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think that there was an element in that crowd 
that was ex that, 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 that heard the announcement, that understood he was coming in, he was coming on the back of a donkey, they got it, and they embraced him completely as king. And they made a way. And so when I address this this morning, when I say today, make a way for the king, there's two levels I'm asking you about this. And, and I want you to know, some of you have not given your heart to Christ, you don't know all about this, and I'm going to invite you to make a way for the king. For some of you that have been walking for the Lord, walking with the Lord, again, I'm going to ask you, make a way for the There's probably some places in your life where you need to just open up the doors and swing the gates open. Stop locking Jesus out and let him in. Does that make sense? And so these, there, I think there was a combination of people in that crowd. And I think there were other ones that were supremely skeptical because they said, okay, so this guy's basically coming in and making a big kerfuffle and they're throwing palm branches and doing all this like he's a king or something like that. But on a donkey? Are you kidding me? <laughs> right? It just doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to the eyes of individuals. Jesus could have come in on a horse. He would have been announcing, and that would have been actually taken as a more military, uh, especially in those days. I mean, I wonder if King David, if he would have rode into battle on a donkey, if his, if his warriors would have taken him seriously either. So you got to understand in the context and the frame of the time, Jesus coming in on a donkey, he chose it to, cho to show you humility. Oh, my Lord, we need to learn to be humble. And so you've got a combination of people. Some are skeptical. Some are just kind of going with the flow. Okay, yay. And there's some that are really there. When there's a proclamation of the king, there is an expectation that you and I respond. Whether or not we've been walking with him or never have, there's an expectation. Because I also found out that in the presence of a king sometimes or royalty, if you did not curtsy or bow or even treat the, the presence they were, the king was at with respect, you would either be uh, 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 fined, punished, thrown in jail, or sometimes your life would be taken. Your life would be taken. So I think a lot of times in the house of God, we kind of minimize God's presence sometimes. Ouch. I mean, I've been in this a while, and sometimes, you know, especially especially during an altar time, you know, you got people chit-chatting in the back. Because I'm not saying they do that here. I'm not saying at the back of the church with the box there. But <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas again. But, but we need to understand that there comes a time where we're, especially with the, like, the Shekinah presence, we throw that around. But when God's glory is made manifest, we need to respond. It doesn't matter whether you and I feel like it. Jody knows, right? You know. There's times where I don't feel like it, but you do it anyway. We need to respond. See, he's the king no matter if everything's falling apart. He's the king if it's all going right. He's the king if, if it's cloudy outside. He's the king if it does, doesn't make sense. He is the king if you're on your last breath. He, breath, he is still the king. So when you make a way for the king, you're acknowledging the proclamation of the king. But then there's an expectation for you and I not only to recognize. See, a lot of people that day in that crowd, I think, recognized it. But not enough of them received it. Does that make sense? We need to not just recognize it. It's not enough to say, oh, yeah, that, yeah, he was great, great teacher. A lot of people think Jesus is a great guy. A lot of people think he existed, think he's a great guy in the line of prophets, great moral teacher. He is more than that. He is the king. And so when I say make a way for the king, one of the first points that I want to draw quickly this morning is that when we say that, we are saying he is the rightful king. He is the rightful king. I know, and you've probably heard back again, I, I will refer to history. A lot of times when there are royal families or families who were in succession or li in line to the throne, there was a lot of foolish in, foolishness and tomfoolery going in the background. And a lot of times you, could, you don't have to go very far. You go into the 1800s or 1700s, you'll find out family members who would manipulate, chill, uh, cheat, excuse me, lie, destroy and even kill their own brothers and sisters so they could get their rightful place on the throne. 
But Jesus wasn't about that. He was already rightful king, and he was letting you know. Letting me know. Letting us know. And so these families in, on, on the earthly plane were fighting bigger, do all these despicable things to get to the throne. But Jesus proclaimed his rightful place as the heir to the throne. He is the rightful king. And again, I will repeat it to you. I know that some of you are going through so much as heaviness, as anxiety. We've been talking a lot about that. It seems to be at the forefront of everything. God is still the rightful king whether the bombs are dropping. God is still the rightful king when all hell is breaking loose around you. He is still king. When we honor that, that is, where, again, that proclamation means that there's an expectation of us. The ball is in your court. The ball is in your court. He is the rightful king. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, rejoice greatly. Uh, rejoice greatly, excuse me, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. I mentioned this before. Maybe you didn't catch it. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. I want to just quickly zone in on this little phrase that it says, see, your king comes to you. Now, this is a bit of a reversal in the protocol king thing. Because a lot of times, you went to the king when you needed something. Does that make, right? It, it, you remember the book of Esther? What did, what did Queen Esther do, right? She, she wanted to change something. She was nervous. Why was she nervous? Because a lot of times, if you showed up unannounced in the king's court, if you did some of the things, there was a penalty. And so she prayed before the Lord, went before the king, made her request. You've got to understand, this was a big deal in those days. So when Jesus is saying he's the rightful king in this, he's also looking down the face of Caesar. We often forget that. Caesar was looked at as king. Even in the French Empire, right up almost into the 17 and 1800s, uh, uh, whichever Louis it was, they were looked as the sun king. They were looked as the god king. They literally felt anyone who was a king was a god. I like to say I'm king of the house, but I ain't no god. Because I know the queen, and she runs it. Can I get an amen? All is well in my kingdom. Thank you, dear. <laughs> but, but yeah yeah oh it's it'll be on youtube for sure so we there's that expectation so you know they were revered as as gods these kings say going back into egypt pharaoh was considered a god just by mere position and yet we know that jesus is is god but yet we don't treat him like it but the wonder is, behold and see. It's just like saying, behold, look, you see? He came to you. A lot of times we say, I found Jesus. I want to tell you something. You didn't find him. He found you. No offense to you. Seriously, I used to say that, and I thought about it theologically. I want to tell you something. He found us way before we even took our first breath. That's what makes him God. Somebody asked me one time, Carlos, can you please explain the Trinity? And I said, I can't. It's a mystery. And if I have it figured out, then I become the child of a lesser God. I can't figure God out. I don't understand all his ways. But he's the rightful king. It is who he said he is and was and always will be. See, instead of going to the king, I love this, he came to us, bringing salvation with him in his hand. And you want to know something? The next time we see him, he's not going to be on the back of a donkey. Oh, you should have been putting up your hands and praising the Lord right now. He's not going to return on a donkey. He's not. He's not. One thing I, I know the Spirit is telling me even now, he's, you know, that wasn't the first time actually Jesus rode in on a donkey. He rode in one time, the first time when he was in his, when he was in his mother's womb. You see, and what I'm talking, when I'm say, saying make way for the king, what I'm really saying is make room for him. And when the herald is saying that proclamation, the expectation is there. So this is what happens. Jesus is about to be born. Nobody had room for him then. But guess what? God's plan still went through whether there was no room or not. Make room for him. Make a way for the king, the king 
is coming. Secondly, I want to address very quickly that he is not only the rightful king, he is the victorious king. Oh, man, I love it when my favorite football team wins the game. I'm, I, Jodia, it's, it's a bad thing. Maybe I need to come talk to you about it. But it just, <laughs> right, it's, it's, I love it. I love to celebrate victory. How many of you love to celebrate? Okay, that's two of you. How many of you love to celebrate? Right? I've got a, a young son who's going to, God willing, graduate high school. I am going to be celebrating. I've got another one that's going to be finishing university in December. If you don't think I'm a little bit proud, I'm going to be celebrating. I love the victory of the fact that they've gotten through this point in their lives. It's wonderful. I love victory. What victory says is, I won! You win because God already won. We saw the victorious king, not uh, almost there, almost got the victory. It's the third quarter, we're almost there. No, he already won, lock, stock, and barrel. Listen, the week, the Passion Week, as they call it, here they are. The people are going, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, Hosanna. Listen, the Passion Week for Jesus was a week of majorly high highs and low lows. Because in, within the span of days, first they hailed him and then they nailed him. But he was still not only the rightful king, he is the victorious king. That was, he is. He is. He is. He is. So not only was he betrayed and unjustly treated as we move into the week, the Passion Week, we understand they celebrated him. He was still the rightful king. They recognized. He's only some people, like I said, did the surface thing. They just recognized him. Other people received him. Do you know what the shepherds did? They had the herald and all those angels that proclaimed it. Imagine you're Abinadab, the shepherd. And on that night you go, oh, yeah, okay, I can recognize that. Cool. And then you're like, okay, Egbert. And just stayed there. Did the shepherds do that? What did they do? They went and they worshipped. They got it. These were the people that were basically deemed below average, probably, uh, intelligence or just smelly people that walked around with these walking carpets. But those guys understood it. They not only recognized the herald, they also then said, we recognize it. We hear that proclamation, and we're now understanding what is expected of us. And they went straight to worship the king. They understood then. And so Jesus, as an innocent lamb, would not only be betrayed, unjustly treated, he would die as a ransom for us all. There's a lot of talk in different circles in theology and people and scholars that talk about well, what happened. Did Jesus actually descend into hell? What was going on? That's a lot of stuff to cover, and I'm not trying to skip all that today because I only have seven hours to preach to you today. But what are the, And I don't want you to falling out of the window like Eutychus when Paul was preaching. You remember that if you read your Bible? So this is what I, I, I want you to understand today. I don't fully understand all the ramifications of what happened, but we know one thing is for sure. And I'm going to read to you from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, every single one of them. Oh, I'm glad about that. Having can't... I don't know, this is the NIV, so I know some of you may have different versions. I want you to underline this, please, because this is going to get exciting now. Here we go. Fasten your seatbelt. First of all, in verse 14, having underlined these three words, cancel the charge of our legal indebtedness. Satan was actually, we were indebted to him. Through, does that, you get it? That's it. When we sin entered the world, the Lord taught, oh my goodness, how many of you have kids you tell the kid not to touch the cookie jar, and then all of a sudden, two minutes later, you see the chocolate, you're going, I didn't do it. Jesus said, I give you, God, excuse me, said, every, I give you everything, just don't go to that tree. What do they do? He forgives us of all our sins, so he canceled the charge. Right from then, we were indebted to sin. 
which stood, and listen what the scripture says, it stood against us and condemned us. I want to tell you, when you cross over and you make way for the king and accept, accept him as your Lord and your king and your savior, you are no longer indebted to sin. It is your choice whether you want to live in it or not. One of the worst cells to live in is the one that you have the key to. Cancel the charge. And it says, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it where? To the cross. Verse 15, I want you to underline this one word if you have this in version. It says, and having disarmed, underline disarm, because I'm going to show you what these words mean, because we're going to have a reason to celebrate here in a minute. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a, underline this too, I'm sorry, you can do a lot of, I should have, I should have brought highlighters for everybody, I'm sorry, made a public spectacle, underline public spectacle, I love this, made a public spectacle of them, and then underline this last word, triumphing over them by the cross, and take that word triumph, and now turned it into a verb, only our Jesus can do that. Take a quick look at the word cancel. Here, the word is exelipho in the Greek. I won't say it again. And it says it's a compound verb. That first part, ek, means out of. If you've done any study of the word church, it is ecclesia, or, or as they say in Spanish, iglesia. And what it literally means is the, is the assembly or group of called out ones. We are called out. And so in the context of this word here for the word cancel, it literally means that the other word alipho, so when you get exalipho, you put it together, it means to completely wipe out, to obliterate, to smear, or to cover. Jesus wiped away your debt to sin. You are free. That's why we serve a victorious king. So now when you look here, he says he wiped your debt. I listen. There's a couple of things I fantasize about. One of them is that I look like the rock, but that's not going to happen. I look more like the pebble. Why are you laughing so much? But listen to this. I want to put it in a context because some of you are going, yes. Yeah. And maybe for some of you don't, don't understand. Let me put it in a context you might understand a little better. Imagine... Or maybe a phone call. Who knows? And somebody says, well, let's say me. Carlos, hi. Uh, this is the RBC. We just want to let you know that uh, your mortgage has been paid in full. And then I say, who is this? Right? Maybe it's somebody playing a prank on me. You, ever, you know what I'm talking about? And then I get an email. And it's a credit card company, and they said, all your bills have been paid and cleared off. Then I get another call, and they said, your son's uh, student loan money has all been paid for. Your car's been paid off, by the way. By this point, I probably have a car heart attack. I probably would have dropped it on the floor because it's amazing. Do you hear what I'm talking about? All your debts canceled. Satan's plans canceled through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's an old song I remember. I don't know if anyone remembers Michael English. I don't know if you know the name. But he sang a song with the gay, the vocal band. And this was a while. And I loved the song. It says, all my debts canceled. Satan's plans canceled through the blood I made worthy. And I stand worthy. I am free. Bless his holy name. That's what we get through a victorious king. When you make a way for the king, you give him his rightful place. And he already has it. But now you have to give him his rightful place in your heart. And then you earn that victory with him. It's like he hands it right back off to you. Isn't that wonderful? So if any of you want to deposit it to my account and pay off my mortgage, I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> the word disarm here in the context of the scripture means to strip or to tear off. Have you ever teared a strip off somebody? Have you ever got a, a strip torn off of you? Is it fun? This is a military action. It's like Jesus went into the ring with an armored foal and said, didn't even attack him, just give me that. Rip! 
Oh, man, I got goosebumps when I read that. He went in there and he ripped the armor off the enemy. He tore a strip off him. Moving on, it says he not only disarmed him but stripped it. He said he made a public spectacle. That means the Lord made a show of his enemy by exposing him. And then in that last word, that triumphing, triumph, that word, we've been talking about the triumph of the what? Uh Uh-oh, Jody, they don't know. The triumph of the? Yes, this is part eight of triumph of the gospel. And the triumph, Jesus not only takes his word, which is a noun or whatever it was, I'm sorry, English teachers, but he makes it into a verb. He says triumphing. And this is what he was literally doing. If you know anything about the Old Testament, again, in days of antiquity, in old history, you will understand that when a king was vanquished and he fought another king, they gouged his eyes out. And they would take him and either hook him here or by the nose and lead him around in a procession. And the king would say, look what I found. Oh, man, the enemy has done so much in this world to destroy and disrupt things. But one day the Lord, as he did, he continues to expose him and he's got him by the cloak. of the. He's got him. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know it doesn't seem like it. But if you're going to make a way for the king, he's rightful king and he is victorious. God, that the, the triumph, this is the triumph of the gospel. Jesus is the victorious king. Finally, here today, I want to kind of give you an imagery. We've talked, it kind of seems, you know, militarist, there's a lot of things going on here. And one of the things that we need to recognize is he is also the gentle king. Isn't that good? I remember when I was younger and... Uh, I show this in one of my favorite movies still. I like the old school one with the animation is Lion King. Have you ever seen that one? You know, he says, Mufasa. Ooh, hey? Mufasa. <laughs> Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I love that. Every time I say it now, I just got to react. Mufasa. Ooh. Hey? And you saw so many different sides of the Lion King. I was a loving father, and then we had to roar, you know, and, and do all that. I can't even roar. Forget it. I'm not even going to try it. But you saw so many different sides of the Lion King. And one of the things is the Bible says he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Have you ever seen? Like, when I was a kid, I didn't realize how big a lion really is. How fierce a lion is. And yet a lion can be gentle. I don't know if you've ever thought of that. I think it's a mistake to assume, though, that when we say someone is gentle, it means that they're weak. The word gentleness is translated into meekness, and that word meekness means power that is ab- in, uh, under control. It is un- it's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Power that is under control. And when I think of the gentleness of God, I see the image of a father, one who cares, one who heals, one who restores, as it says in Psalm 33, that he is a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. If I can leave you this last picture uh, th- this morning about a gentle king, when he says the lifter of my head, this is what I think about. I can't remember which one of my sons it was or who, what happened. I just remember this image of when they were downcast. Anybody here ever been downcast before? Anybody here been depressed? You're a human being. I'm a human being. We go through times in life where the darkness is so dark, you never knew that dark could get that dark. You ever feel like you were a blind person in a dark room looking for a black cat that wasn't even there? You ever feel like that? The weight of the world is on you. And here we're going to make a way for the king, the victorious king, the rightful king. And the gentle king understands that we go through things. David said, why, thou, why art thou downcast, O my soul? Sometimes we got to talk to ourselves. Anybody here talk to themselves? Yep, I lose every argument with myself. What I see is the image in a gentle king as I see this. He's the lifter of our head. Some of you have been like this. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's something that you've been going through that you didn't ask for. Do you know what I'm talking about? It had nothing to do with you, but you're in the middle of this now. And then sometimes you go into God and say, God, I've done what I can. I don't understand. Why? Has anyone ever asked why? Did you know that Jesus asked why too on the cross? See, in our Christianity, we need to embrace our humanity. And I know that 
that Jody made the mistake, and we all were, <laughs> were kind of joking with you, but he's right. We're all human. There's days where it just seems like we have the patience of Job, and in other days, we got the patience of none. And here's the imagery I see. Your head is down. And I remember doing this for my sons. It's okay, baby. It's okay, baby. Look at me. Have anyone, has anyone done that with their child? Come here, honey. Look at me. Look at me. Maybe it's a situation you got yourself into. You know you're the one to fall. Guess what? It's okay. Jesus is saying, I'm the gentle king. It's okay, baby. Look up. Some of you have been praying for your sons and your daughters for a long time. Some of you have been seeking God for this situation. It doesn't seem to let go. Some of you have been praying about your health. Some of you have been anxious about that. The gentle king is here. He is the lifter of your head, and he is your glory. And so he is gently placing his hand on your chin even now, saying, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to lift your head up today. Do you need a lift today? Do you need to make a way for the king? We need to receive him as the rightful king. We need to receive him as the victorious king and receive him as our gentle king. And don't get it confused with weakness because our God is not weak. There's going to be that day he's going to write. And what does that scripture say? He's going to have the names of everybody. And I don't understand what all that fully means, but I'm telling you, he's writing back. And guess who's going to be following me with him? See? You see? You see? So I want to encourage you this morning. When you make a way for the king. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you if you go home and I don't know if you're cooking a roast or having sandwiches or Weight Watchers, whatever it is that you're going to have. <laughs> right? Let me encourage you to do this. Find that song. It's called Make a Way for the King. Is that right? the right title? I forget. Is that Make a Way for the King? Oh, the king is coming. Okay, yeah. I, yeah. Oh, you know that. Oh, you're cool. Yeah. We have the king. And there's another one by the newsboys, too, called uh, The King is Coming. Make a way for, make a way for the king. You need to make a way for the king. Make a way for the king. So, again, I'm going to get back to that statement I made before. Maybe some of you don't know who Jesus is, but I want to tell you he's the rightful king. He's the victorious king. He won a victory for you, and all you have to do is say, you know what? I heard the proclamation today. Now there's an expectation. The ball's in your court. Now, I want to, God bless you, that's all right. I just want to let you know this too. You've been walking with the Lord a while, and you're frustrated. Can I get an amen? It's okay. It's all right. But I, I feel bad because I don't want to make you think like I'm trying to force you to come to the altar. Or not, but I want to challenge you to do something. When you come to the altar, it's because you need to understand what the proclamation that was made. There's an expectation in God. Does, it, does everybody understand what I'm saying? And guess what? You get altered at the altar. I'm not a tailor. When we went to buy our son a suit the other day so he could do his presentations with his group in university, we went to a tailor so they could make alterations. The suit needed to be changed. One size does not fit all, Jody. It doesn't. God wants to make some alterations in our life. Does that make sense to you? So whether you've been walking with him for years, or whether you've been walking, him for, walking with him for a month, or whether you've never walked with him, there's an invitation to go, listen, stop acting like you've got it all together. I do not have it all together. My wife ironed my shirt. She dressed me today. I need help. How many of us need help? If we need help, I run to the Lord. I run to the Lord who is my what? Right? I look to the mountains from when comes my what? My help. And my help comes from the, not the self-help book, which are nice, not just the friends that God puts in your life, but my help comes from who? Stop messing around and come running to the Lord. Come make a way for the king. Let me invite the truth. Come on, let's get the musicians up. Make a way for the king. Let me invite you to stand to this, this morning. Come on, let's stand. Let's stand. Make a way for the king. Make a way for the king is the proclamation this morning. 
Make a way for the victorious king. Make a way for the one who has died and rose again for you. Jesus is not just about the 99. He's about the one. You've been praying for that one daughter. You've been praying for that one son. God wants to do something. But we have to take that step in faith. I want to encourage you this morning as the worship team begins to sing a song of invitation. The proclamation has been made and now there is the expectation of response. But here's the thing, when you respond, there's also re expectation of what God will do. How many of you know that God will do things in his time? In his time. If you would have told me 30 years ago I would have been in this wonderful country with the maple leaf. If you would have told me that I would have met my beautiful wife and had two beautiful children, I would have said, you're crazy. And yet, here we are. God wants to do something in your life now. The challenge, this what stop, listen, stop being embarrassed. Well, what if I go up there? It doesn't matter. We need to fear the Lord more than the opinions of people. What was that? Do you really believe that? If you can, listen to the song and let the Lord's Spirit just begin to speak to you. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace. Thank you for joining us today online. And we pray that you have received it, whether through the worship or through the word. Just thanks for joining us today. And um, we just want to take this time to pray over you and your family. And this week that's coming up, that when you put God in your life, when you put God in your decision making, when you put God in your money, when you put God in your world period, it changes everything. That's why we do what we do. And that's why we say here, hope lives here. So I'm just going to pray over you. And again, if you need anything, if you just need help, feedback, whatever it may be, our information will follow right after this prayer time. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the word that we heard through worship and the word and prayer time. For those that I'm talking to up there, whether it's YouTube world, our website, Facebook world, wherever they're finding us, Father, I pray that a blessing of the living God will be upon their lives, favor and strength and Father would be their portion. Just be with them today. Give them a great week that there be salvation, there be healing, and there be strength in Jesus' name. God bless you folks. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you again real soon. Hey everyone. We here at St. Croix Christian Center are so pleased to have you check in with us. Stay tuned for our upcoming events. Sunday evenings at 6.30 is our Overcomers group. God is doing great things and we are thrilled with the growth in this program. In-person prayer meeting is happening Tuesday at 7 p.m. What an honor it is to be able to get together and hear praise reports of prayers that have been answered and then enter into God's presence. He is so faithful to show up and prayer is truly making a difference. We see the results. Hello everybody, Asher here, and I've got a message from Ignite Youth. Come on down to come on down for fun times, games, food, talks about the Lord, and more. Open from 7 to 8. See you there. We would love to have you join us every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. on Facebook or YouTube for our weekly word online. Come out to Kingdom Kids every Sunday at 10 a.m. We have food. Easter Egg Escapade, Friday, April 15th, 1 to 3 p.m. at St. Croix Christian Center. Come out for an Easter egg hunt, games, and food for kindergarten to grade 5. We will be blessing a family again this year with Easter boxes. Each box provides a complete Easter dinner. If you would like to participate, you can e-transfer your donation to give at sc cc dot online in Marcus Easter. Thank you. Hi folks, it's that time of year again. We are collecting items for our Philippine missionaries, Dale and Gwen French. The deadline for donations is May 15th. You can contact Heather Wilcox to arrange pickup or you can drop items off here at the church. They are also in need of monetary donations to cover the shipping costs. You can find the list at the back of the church with some ideas of the types of items they are looking for. 
This is an amazing ministry to be part of, and they appreciate all they receive very much. Thank you for all you do. And you can contact Heather Wilcox at 467-7033. Thank you. Thank you for your faithful giving to this local and global vision. Here are ways you can give by mail, by text, by e-transfer, online, or the box at the back of the church. These ministries would not be possible without the help and generosity of all of you. We are looking forward to what God has in store. God bless. This Easter Sunday, April 17th at 10 a.m. We are celebrating our risen Savior from the manger to the cross. The message of hope was the theme of Christ's journey. The ultimate expression of hope was dying on the cross and rising again on the third day. Over 2,000 years later, over 2.3 billion Christ followers will come together and celebrate this living hope in Jesus Christ. We will be in person at 444 Milltown Boulevard and online on our Facebook and YouTube channels.